Um, good afternoon, and please do accept our apologies for the slight delay due to a technical hitch, but we're here now, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to today's briefing and to update you on Jersey's reconnection roadmap and the further easing of the restrictions we have all been living with. I'm joined today by Senator Ian Gorse, the Minister for External Relations, and Dr Ivan Muscat, the Deputy Medical Officer for Health. As islanders will know, in response to an increased number of COVID cases in recent weeks, we had to pause some parts of our reconnection plan. And that was the right decision at the time to protect the community. The case numbers now show that the wave is receding and we are ready to reconnect. Yesterday, ministers agreed that from Thursday the 26th of August, we will move to stage seven of our reconnection roadmap. By that date, the third wave will be behind us and over 80%, that's four out of five adults, will be fully vaccinated. From the 26th of August, there will no longer be restrictions on gatherings. You can meet with as many friends and family as you want, in your home, your garden, on the beach, in the park. You will no longer have to wear masks, with the exception, of course, at the ports and on public transport. The recommendation to work from home will also end. Stand-up drinking will be permitted and nightclubs can reopen and dancing will also be permitted once again. And I'm also very pleased that large events will be able to go ahead, subject to risk assessments and approval of the bailiffs panel. And we are going to work very closely with the bailiffs panel to help facilitate this. Our vaccination programme continues at a strong pace, but many younger islanders are still not vaccinated. And I would urge everyone who is yet to do so to please book an appointment through gov.je, to call the coronavirus hotline or to attend one of the pop-up vaccination sessions. It is a responsibility we have to one another to protect our island and to allow our freedoms and liberties to be restored. Fewer people are testing positive for COVID and fewer people are seeking med medical assistance as a result. And this is very positive news. And it is time to start thinking about moving our focus from active case numbers to providing the appropriate health care to those in our community who become unwell as a result of COVID, just as we do with every other medical condition. The move to stage seven marks a distinct change in the way our island will deal with the pandemic. Until now, our strategy has been to suppress infection rates using robust measures which involve large scale restrictions. And those measures have helped bring down the infection rates, but at a cost to our freedoms and our liberties. We must now return islanders' freedoms as soon and as fully as it is safe to do so. Now that we have attained a very high level of vaccination, our strategy can change from one of suppression to one of more active mitigation. This means that we, as individuals, take action to control the spread of the virus as part of our daily lives. So continue to follow best practices, participate in track and trace if you visit a bar or restaurant, continue to wash, sanitize your hands. And if you do get symptoms, please do get them checked out. The recent wave of cases has shown that the risk of an outbreak of mild to moderate infection remains. But if islanders continue to get vaccinated and to take the right precautions, then we will be able to live with COVID without allowing it to dominate or restrict our freedoms. Of course, we always stand ready to take appropriate measures to protect our uh, safety and the safety of the community if we have to. But it is our sincere hope that we will not have to return to the very strict measures that we have had to live with over the past 18 months. I will now ask Senator Gorse to speak about the changes to travel, especially how we are assisting islanders visiting France before we take questions from the media. Thank you, Ian. Uh, thank you, Senator Farnham. Um, I welcome the announcements which have just been made and agree that we must continue working as a community to protect one another. I encourage everyone eligible to get their vaccination. I want to quickly provide an update regarding the plans that are in place for islanders travelling to France. From this Friday, 
those who have requested an interim digital COVID status certification for travel to France, quite a mouthful, should receive their QR codes via email. The codes uh, will come as a PDF, which can be scanned into the approved French app or printed for proof of vaccination status. Islanders should be aware that the French authorities require a period of at least seven days after the second dose for the QR code to be recognised. If those days have not passed, the QR code will be rejected. At the moment, this process is only open to Jersey vaccinated individuals, but a solution is being worked on for those who have been vaccinated elsewhere. The supplied QR codes will be valid for 30 days and should enable travellers to access the shops and restaurants across France which require it. Anyone who requires a code for a longer period than that will need to apply for a replacement certificate by calling the helpline. So, if you are planning to travel to France, please contact the coronavirus helpline to ask for a digital certificate. And please don't forget, of course, before you return to the island, you will need to complete a Jersey travel form, which you can access on gov.je. European countries are updating their vaccination requirements at pace, and I recommend that islanders check the relevant country's official websites before booking travel, and certainly before travelling. Thank you. I'll now pass back to Senator Farnham, uh, who will take questions from the media. Thank you, um, Ian. So welcome to the media. Thank you all for joining us. Um, we're joined today by uh, ITV, the JP, Channel 103, the BBC, and of course, Bailwick Express. So if uh, you don't mind, I will go through from the top of my list and we we'll go to ITV first with Islan. Thank you very much. Um, I wonder, first of all, um, obviously, we're just sort of starting to come out of, of that third wave, as you mentioned. What are the projections in terms of case numbers now that we are um, removing all these restrictions um, at a time where obviously it's coming with the August bank holiday weekend, etc. What are we expecting, expecting to happen with those case numbers as restrictions uh, go? Um, as I, I, I mentioned uh, previously, um, we're, we're looking at case numbers and we're also looking alongside that to perhaps moving our shift in the fullness of time to focusing less on case numbers and more on provi and making sure we have uh, the, you know, clinical capacity to be able to treat people who become unwell. It, it is very likely that we will see um, peaks and troughs with case numbers as we move through the winter. And I'll hand over to Ivan in a minute if I can just to add a, a little bit more detail about that. But it is worth remembering that the vaccination program does not prevent people from getting or, or becoming positive. It reduces the risk, but it's very effective at reducing um, the potential for, for serious harm. And that's what has enabled us to move through um, to stage seven and also to hold ground when we saw very high numbers, over 3,000 of positive cases. We were able to keep the island running um, in a reasonably, um, we were, we were providing as much freedom as we could while retaining a, a safety approach. So perhaps if I could hand over to Ivan, who might be able to put some more detail around what we're, to, uh, what we're going to expect to see with future numbers. Uh, thank you, Deputy Chief Minister. Um, so the, the uh, significance of, of COVID has changed since uh, the introduction of vaccination. Um, and if I can just compare the second and the third wave, uh, because uh, our testing capacity was very good in both those waves, and therefore they, they are, uh, to a large extent, comparable. Uh, and in the second wave, we had something like 3,000 cases, um, of whom 5% uh, were admitted to hospital, um, with uh, a mortality of 1.2% in total. In the third wave, we had uh, just uh, uh, over 5,000 uh, uh, cases uh, to date, uh, with uh, about 1% admission to hospital, 
and the mortality of 0.08%. Uh, so, so vaccination has significantly uh, altered the significance of, of COVID, and we need to bear that in mind. So the numbers are, of course, startling, you know, 5,000 cases, but what does that mean? With increasing reconnection, we will, of course, uh, uh, see uh, the in increased possibility of transmission of virus because that's what reconnection does. Uh, it increases freedom of movement of people and therefore freedom of movement of virus. But there will also be increasing vaccination. We will be monitoring the situation and the significance uh, of uh, any numbers that we see. Uh, and we will, as always, balance the risks. Uh, the, and, and take up appropriate uh, action as needed. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Would, would you... Second question? Yes, yes, go ahead. Lovely. Um, now, obviously, we know that the UK uh, will require proof uh, of double vaccination for people entering at nightclubs and large events from the end of September. Where are we at with that? Are we considering something similar here? Um, in short, no. Ministers discussed that and there was no appetite to introduce that um, uh, to the island. Um, having said that, some businesses might decide to uh, make that a requirement of visiting their establishment. We're, we're not sure. And officers are going to be um, talking to uh, the various business sectors in the, in the days and weeks ahead to make sure that the guidelines we apply to uh, Stage 7 are, are, are workable and sustainable, but no, there's no plans to introduce um, COVID status certification to entry um, into premises in Jersey at this stage. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, shall we go now to Tom at the JP? Hello, Tom. We can see you, Tom, but we can't hear you. Okay, second second take, thank you. Um, Senators and Dr. Muscat, mm -hmm. uh, you t talked about a return to normal life. Obviously, um, uh, people flying to Jersey who are asymptomatic, feeling fine, and then having to be tested on arrival is is that's not um, what we were used to as, as a feature of normal life until 18 months ago. Uh, th does that mean that um, we're, the island will be moving to a, a state that uh, people won't be te tested in that context and that only when they are feeling unwell? Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I think that will come in the fullness of time, but it's difficult to predict um, when, when that will be. Um, I, I'll hand over to Dr Muscat again because um, he can explain better than I about how the, uh, how the community, how society will deal um, with, with the virus, how the virus will uh, evolve or, or, or decline as our immunity um, grows. So Ivan, perhaps... Thank you. Um, so we're on the road uh, to, to normality, but we haven't reached th that destination yet. Uh, we need to keep a close eye on what's going on. These remain uncharted waters. Uh, so as we, one would always do uh, in, in uh, uncharted waters, you move carefully. Um, the uh, virus does mutate, as we all know. Uh, variants do arise. Um, and uh, it is important that uh, uh, we keep an eye on incoming variants uh, of concern from, from other countries, uh, as well as uh, incoming infection as a whole. Uh, uh, interestingly, uh, the proportion uh, of positives we are now seeing uh, from uh, arrivals is increasing uh, relative to the number of people that we are finding positive on Ireland. The positives on Ireland remain higher than uh, arrivals, but that does mean that the borders policy is providing protection uh, for Jersey, uh, and uh, testing uh, and, and tracing remains an important element uh, in uh, our trying to uh, mitigate and manage COVID without uh, unduly restricting people's freedoms. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Would you uh, like another question? That'd be very kind. Thank you. The, um, uh, the, the, the advice you, or, or the notification you're saying that uh, um, uh, uh, the government will be working closely with uh, the bailiffs panel and with businesses to um, on guidance about how they should operate after they're allowed to open on 
the 26th of August. Is, is that a, a, a coded warning from the government to, to say to both operators and to customers, look, you're, you're allowed out, these places are open, but um, um, don't take the Michael because um, if, if you do so and, um, uh, and behavior is bad and standards are lax and, um, and, and things go um, badly awry, then we may have to be more um, heavy handed in the measures that we enforce your businesses with. Um, thanks, Tom. No, it's de definitely not a, a, a coded warning. It's a genuine offer of assistance to make sure we can facilitate the return to normal life as safely as we possibly can. The bailiffs panel um, do a good job and uh, we want to make sure they're provided with the right guidelines so they can make the right decisions and they can make those decisions timely because events, uh, the biggest challenge they have now is, is, is certainty and we've hopefully provided certainty with the 26th of August date and we can be certain about that now because for the first time we're at that level of vaccination um, where we can make that call, whereas in the past we were still pushing ahead with the vaccination program. So the offer is there um, um, to really help facilitate these events and get some normality going. But of course there will be guidelines and we do want um, these events to, to work and deliver um, uh, risk assessments and that will help the bailers panel give the, the relevant permissions because, um, as I said before, it's up to us as individuals if we're going to be able to live with COVID without having to go back to the very uh, restrictive measures and lockdowns we faced in, in, in the past. It's about taking um, responsibility and following the guidelines, you know, track and trace, um, wash your hands and if you get symptoms, report them and just be, you know, be sensible and pragmatic and mindful of others. Do you mind if I ask whether you regret the fact that uh, the biggest festival we have on the island weekend uh, um, announced two days ago that they would not be, be running just ahead of this announcement today? Um, I, I, I have been in touch with um, the organisers of Weekender. We spoke last week. I indicated to them in, in confidence what was being planned and, and, and the timescales. Um, and I think there was still too much uncertainty for them because the announcement wasn't going to be made um, uh, and uh, the, 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 the decision had to be confirmed by ministers, which it, it was yesterday. But there are other considerations for large event organisers such as the Weekender. And I'm hugely disappointed. I've worked with Weekender, well, back in the Jersey Live days, I, was, um, um, I worked closely with them when they started. I was chairman of the Tourism Board and Development Fund and we gave them a grant to, to get the first event going. So I have a strong connection. I think it's one of our, our great events and I'm hugely disappointed that it's not going ahead. But perhaps from an organising point of view and the huge financial risk that it is, uh, that is um, um, here with a, uh, an event like that, it was, it was possibly um, the right decision because I think they're in the territory now of having to pay for everything. Um, and of course, they, they, um, we still are, uh, we still are sort of have, have COVID with us. So I think there were a lot of factors and it's hugely, hugely disappointing, but I very much hope they can uh, come back with a vengeance in 2022. We we'll do everything we can to help them. Thank you, Tom. Thanks. Um, right, can we go to Julian at Bailwick? I think I saw Julian. I oh, welcome Julian. Yeah. And we know that the, um, the the competent authority ministers have signed off on this decision. And we also know that the the, um, the the chief minister is isn't here. And I'm just wondering about the machinations of that. And did the chief minister sign off on these um, decisions that have been made today? Um, yes, we, we, we've been meeting uh, virtually and we met yesterday after, late afternoon that ran into the evening and the Chief Minister joined us um, from his vacation and chaired the meeting. Um, just moving the, the subject slightly to something that's been in the news this week. Um, this week the Environment Minister said he was shocked at the decision to let the Lions come here this week after their tour of um, South Africa and we heard that mm -hmm. Stack did voice their concerns um, at the end of June, but then did support it at a subsequent meeting. So I was just wondering whether I could ask um, Dr. Muscat um, what changed the stack's concern into support? Uh, when we first heard about, about this, uh, we um, uh, had uh, not really looked closely at what was going on in South Africa. Uh, we weren't anticipating this query. Um, and uh, we based our initial our initial reaction uh, was, if you like, 
uh, a reflex in relation to the South African epidemiology that we were aware of. But uh, we, uh, of course, uh, promised to look at the matter closely. And um, the chief uh, concern had been the beta variant in South Africa, um, uh, which uh, has a, a, a somewhat reduced uh, response to, to vaccination. Uh, but when we looked uh, at what had happened uh, in the interim from, when, from the first times that we looked at it, we found that the beta variant was in fact largely replaced by the delta variant, which is the variant, of course, that we have in England, Europe, and in Jersey. Uh, and, and indeed, currently, uh, more than 90% of uh, all isolates in, uh, uh, in uh, South Africa that are sequenced are delta and not beta. Additionally, uh, we uh, were noted that uh, the vast majority of uh, the group uh, had been vaccinated with uh, the Pfizer vaccine, uh, which has something like a 95% efficacy against the beta variant. Uh, uh, additionally, we uh, had been reassured from beforehand and from our experience with the uh, Royal, uh, the Rugby Football Union, uh, of the bubbling and, and, and the expertise they had in keeping themselves safe such that they could play rugby, and that was uh, sustained throughout the visit there. Finally, uh, they were going to be tested on a daily basis before leaving South Africa and on their return uh, to Jersey. So all in all, we felt that the risk of them bringing over uh, beta, which was the only concern, was very low indeed. And, in, uh, and at the time that we were making decisions, interestingly, our fre the frequency of infection in Jersey was greater than the frequency of infection in the Western province, which is where they were based uh, latterly. Um, uh, the final point, uh, there is of course beta in the United Kingdom and beta in Europe as well. So we, we need to put all of that into context and when we did, we felt it was quite safe given the scrutiny and security uh, of this small group that for them to come to Jersey. Um, and uh, last but not least, Freddie at the BBC. Oh, 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 oh sorry. Uh, uh, Harry, I see you on the screen. We'll come to you after, Harry. <laughs> Do Thank apologize. you very much. Uh, yeah, Freddie Miller from BBC yes. Jersey. Apologies to Harry from Channel 103. Um, perhaps I could ask about schools, please. Um, mm. Many uh, students are getting their exam results this week. Of course, most uh, school pupils are not vaccinated against COVID-19, and it's only a few short weeks before they'll be going back to the classroom. What are the plans for schools once they return, particularly now in light of what we've just heard in terms of greater freedoms within the wider community? Is that going to be mirrored within schools? Um, uh, it, it, that is a work in progress that's being led by the edu Education Minister, and his team and um, I think we're going to be ready to make an announcement um, sometime in the very near future but obviously giving plenty of notice for when the um, scores go back of course we're monitoring closely the the um, we, w we want to make sure it's safe for pupils and for the teachers and I think um, we're seeing very good take up amongst the teachers of of, of vaccination so th there will be some measures in relation to schools those measures will be aimed at ensuring that we can keep the schools open and we can keep teaching um, uh, the young people, but further details will be coming shortly. Can I take from that then that it's likely there will be greater restrictions within schools than there will be in the wider community? Um, no, I don't think you can take that at this stage. As I've said before, we're all moving to work, uh, you know, alongside COVID and, 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 and try to um, live with it. And of course, having said that, we're mindful of, of, of the fact that whilst uh, young people are, n uh, you know, are not as at risk as adults, there's still a, um, uh, there's still, we know that, that it can be seeded th through, um, the virus can tra be transmitted um, through families, of course. And I'll hand over to Ivan, because it's probably an opportune time just to talk about the vaccination plans for younger people, if I may, Freddie. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, in relation to vaccination and, and young people, um, the, uh, you're all aware, I think, that uh, uh, 16 and 17 year olds have now been offered uh, the, the opportunity to have one dose of uh, Pfizer vaccine or Moderna. Um, and and that, 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 uh, that is now an open 
uh, uh, open for appointments and people can pop up to, to, to the, 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 the various uh, uh, rock-up clinics that there are uh, for that. Additionally, uh, for 12 to 15-year-olds uh, who are at risk, uh, vaccination is, is uh, now open as well. Um, uh, and we are looking at uh, c contacting uh, those individuals who uh, are immune suppressed and would benefit from ring vaccination of 12 to 15 year olds in their households such that uh, such uh, children, young people would uh, can, can, can avail themselves of that opportunity. Many family members, interestingly, have felt quite anxious uh, over, the, over the last period uh, because they could not be vaccinated because of their age group and they felt they were putting their family members at risk. So that opportunity will now be afforded to them. There's also been an expansion of the number of uh, eligible vulnerable people uh, in the 12 to 15 year olds over and above what was seen uh, in the first part of the rollout of the vaccination program. Um, the JCVI are also looking at the possibility uh, of vaccinating 12 to 15 year olds as a whole, but they are still deliberating on that subject, and I don't know uh, when they will come out with any definitive recommendation in that regard. Um, in terms of schools, there are ongoing uh, meetings all the time. There was one just earlier on this afternoon uh, to look at uh, appropriate testing, lateral flow testing in, in school children and teachers, uh, the possibility of doing PCR testing in some of them, uh, teachers and, and, and perhaps older school children. More COVID occurs in older school children than in younger school children uh, before uh, term resumes. Uh, and to look at uh, practical aspects like ventilation, CO2 monitoring and so forth to try to keep schools as safe as possible, to try to keep as many people going to schools uninterrupted throughout the terms that are ahead of us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fred. Um, and my second one, if I may? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, we've spoken to event companies who, mm -hmm. um, of course, will be very pleased, I think, now to have certainty as to the date at which um, they'll be able to, to start getting back to normal. Uh, but there is still concern amongst companies that run larger events that these, these events do take an awfully long time to plan. There's a lot that goes into it. Um, and it's going to mean that they can't really start doing big events until next year. So there's still going to be a period now where they're permitted to do events, but they can't actually do them due to logistical and practical reasons. And as a result of that, many are saying that they feel the payroll support scheme ought to be uh, continued. At the moment, it's due to end at the end of September, whereas other business support schemes are continuing. So can you let us know if there have been um, any decisions one way or another about continuing with the payroll support scheme and the thoughts behind it? Please? No, um, and thank you, Freddie. That's a, a good point because the event sector has probably been the hardest hit, uh, particularly now when they make um, their money. Uh, we haven't decided yet on what we might do with the payroll past September. Um, those are those discussions are ongoing. But I do reiterate the undertaking um, that we've given as ministers uh, that we will always strive to pro provide the appropriate support to ensure that we can keep these important businesses uh, are going. Now, if that means we have to extend uh, a payroll for the event sector in some form through the winter, um, then we will do it. But we're going to have to have um, conversations with the sector. We're going to have to see how we get on post August the 26th. Um, and um, so, so the answer to that is, look, we, we can't give any guarantees at this stage, but um, the commitment is certainly there to make sure we continue to provide appropriate support where it's needed. Okay, thank you. Ministers, Dr. Muscat, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Freddie. And Harry, um, saving the best to last, of course, at Channel 103. Come in, Harry. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to build on a question asked by Islin earlier, if I may. You mentioned you're not looking at doing what England are doing in regards to needing two doses to go into nightclubs, large events. It seems like they're doing it to boost take up amongst younger age groups and it seems like that might be having an effect i've seen they're doing campaigns and uk government are working with nightclubs to encourage take up and you mentioned earlier in your in, in your introductory speech that um, you'd like to see maybe more young people uh, take up the vaccine so can you explain further why you're not looking to do what england are doing in regards to that and, and what else can you do then to boost take up amongst amongst younger age groups particularly maybe the 18 to 29 group mm. I, I think in jersey we really value um, our civil liberties our freedoms our our freedom of choice 
and, and, and the right to choose. So we, uh, we respect that. And whilst we uh, encourage uh, as many people as possible to vaccinate, the more people that vaccinate, the more chance that the community has of getting through this with minimal um, uh, disruption. Um, we, we stand by the, the, those principles. So that's sort of the overarching um, reason behind the, um, the decision. Um, what we are, are doing to encourage um, young people to gain support, you would have seen a really tremendous effort by our, our comms team and the fantastic vaccination team now with the dropping clinics and the pop-up clinics and um, using um, young people, using, um, you know, uh, sort of peers, young people. Um, we've got some excellent young, young people who've embraced the vaccination program um, as, you know, and, and, and have become, you know, great, great examples of, of, of what we hope young people will do. And of course, young people, I think, tend to take more notice of their peers than they do of, of, uh, of us um, older uh, politicians. So um, I think that's the message. That's what we're going to keep um, uh, pushing out. And of course, you know, assurance from Dr. Muscat uh, and the team that taking the vaccination is safe. There's a lot of misinformation, sadly, being peddled out there. Um, and it is safe. And Ivan, did you want to just add some words of reassurance, perhaps, for young people? Uh, uh, you, you, you're absolutely right. Vaccination has stood the test of time over very many years, and COVID vaccination is now starting to join uh, that, that collection of vaccines that uh, have proven to be safe uh, and effective. It is estimated that in the UK, uh, COVID vaccination has prevented something like 30,000 deaths and prevented some 8 million infections. Uh, the uh, safety uh, of uh, COVID vaccination um, is becoming more and more apparent as we go forward. Uh, the risk of severe side effects is extremely low, and the risk of severe s disease due to COVID and 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 uh, 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 an, in a, uh, an unfortunate outcome is 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 great. Uh, compared with uh, uh, the benefits of, of vaccination, you really have to go for vaccination. People, I think, as a whole need to wake up to the reality of it. Vaccination does save lives and does prevent severe disease and does prevent transmission. And we all need to remind ourselves of that, particularly when we come across misinformation to the opposite effect. Thank you. I think Ian would like to add yeah. something. Yeah, I just want to reiterate what Senator Farnham said, Harry, and the Deputy Medical Officer for Health. We are a small, close-knit community. Uh, we share each other's burdens. I personally don't think it's right that we should force each other to take a particular approach uh, to vaccination. I think we should encourage everyone. It's the socially responsible thing to do if we are uh, seeking to protect our own health our own family, our own work environment, our own friends. We should make strongly the case against some others who are using um, uh, arguments which are not based on good science and are not based on fact as far as I can see, and certainly the Deputy Medical for Fair Health has just confirmed that again. We should make the strong, positive argument that those who are eligible should take the vaccination and we'll deal with that question around 12 to 16 year olds when the JVCI do. But at the heart of your question actually is a dilemma that islanders are going to face because as we travel, islanders going to the continent are more and more going to need to be vaccinated in order to access premises on the continent. If the UK government follows through uh, with its aim of introducing that at the end of September. Islanders that want to go to the United Kingdom and go to nightclubs and uh, various venues, they're going to have to be vaccinated as well. And I think that that, uh, that will help Islanders make a positive, strong decision to be vaccinated because it's in all of our interest to get as high a possible vaccination rate as we can because we've already seen the benefit during this third wave. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ian, Harry, do you have another?
question. Yes, please. Um, it's been a regular question, I think, um, through press conferences through most of the year, actually. Um, but we are getting towards the end of summer, going into autumn, and maybe uh, there'll be fl fewer flights um, coming out of, you know, the summer holiday season. Are we still looking at introducing a, a charge for for testing coming into the island? Has, has a figure been come up with? And are we any closer to knowing when that might be introduced? Um, so it's it's still on the agenda. No firm decisions have been made, uh, and no prices have been uh, or charge charge levels have been uh, properly discussed at this stage. So it's something that we're um, still thinking about, and of course, the the outcome of that will depend very largely on 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 what happens, how we move forward with COVID in the in the weeks ahead. Right. Thank you all um, very much. And I think that draws today's uh, press conference uh, to an end. So can I um, thank you all very much for being here and thank the media for supporting, as they always do, um, these events and for their, for their broadcasts um, live. I understand there was a problem, or there is a problem with Facebook. The problem um, is with uh, Facebook. We're unable to um, uh, have been live there uh, this afternoon, as I understand it. But the, as soon as that... Um, the platform is fixed. We will be putting this um, whole conference up for Facebook viewers to attend. And I'm very, I suppose, relieved and, and pleased that for, for the first time, really, and there's never really been a time in the pandemic when we could give an absolute um, guarantee. And regrettably, that meant we had to postpone the announcement on the move to stage seven several times. But we can deliver that with certainty today simply because of the work of the vaccination team, the uh, fantastic um, effort of Islanders to embrace the vaccination program and for their fortitude and forbearance throughout the whole um, pandemic. So together, keeping close together, as Ian said, as a community, as we are helping each other, we will get through this. Thank you all very much and have a very pleasant day. <laughs>